I I would add, um, and you may edit this out of <laughs> out of a uh, recording here, but um, I don't want to be too harsh. But do more than complain. Welcome to the UOUC Talk Show. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Welcome, Dr. Haran. Good to be here. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing good here in this uh, beautiful new building with up and coming YouTube stars. <laughs> That's <laughs> not the goal, but engineers. Engineers, engineers. Yeah. okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to start off with a really straightforward question. When do you think electric propulsion systems would be a reality? Wow. Okay. Um, it depends on what you mean. Okay. Electric propulsion means could mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, since you are asking me that question, I assume you're talking about aircraft. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's certainly electric vehicles that are that are moving. Um, there's also the I'll give you the story. So when I got in the field of total digression and tangent here, got in the field of electric propulsion, I would attend these conferences uh, by AIAA, and there'll be sessions on electric propulsion, well attended. But after I sat in for a few minutes, I realized it's not the electric propulsion I was thinking of. Mm. Electric propulsion for space, right? Um, <laughs> not the ones that are air breathing or, you know, not the um, aircraft that are flying in the atmospheric right. air, right? So I'm going through all this elaborate <laughs> discussion to narrow down your question to, I assume you mean aircraft that are flying in the atmosphere, uh, going from jet engines or turboprops to electric. Uh, those already exist, right? So there are two-seater, four-seater type um, small aircraft that you can by today. There's a Pipistrel aircraft that's certified in the in Europe. I think they're coming to the US as well. Um, but the area that we work on, it's to electrify the the larger aircraft, we say the, the commercial transport aircraft, like the, the regional jets, the one that fly from Chicago to here, the Embraer type, or even larger, like the Boeing 737 type aircraft, right? So those are not electric. And I will answer that question. When will those become electric? I think we're talking about um, maybe a, a, a decade, um, right? You, you would st so there's a long process, as you can imagine. You had to make the technology work. Then you had to get the certified, go through regulatory approvals. Then you have to make them commercially viable, you know, introduce it as a product, and it had to penetrate the, the market. I'm talking about the early adopters maybe maybe 10 years 10 years yeah what's what's stopping them from like what what are the hurdles which we still need to overcome okay all of those i just mentioned right so the first is obviously technology yeah. right and as i said the small electric aircraft already exist so why not larger ones yeah. it's um just size weight efficiency right um and when people talk about electric propulsion, um, I think depending on who your audience is, most people jump to like the Tesla, right? The battery electric. So the power energy comes from batteries. That is very hard to do with the large aircraft, right? That fly long ranges because the batteries are not nearly the energy density we need right. to replace uh, jet fuel. Right? I mean, they're orders of magnitude worse, or orders of magnitude heavier, right? Um, so what we, people are looking at as an interim solution would be, you know, hybrids. You can have a little bit of batteries, um, some jet fuel, so you can have series hybrid, parallel hybrid. There are also concepts they call turboelectric, mm -hmm. where you generate the electric power on board, so very little or no uh, batteries. 
So you, that way you solve the energy storage problem. Then the other hurdle would be everything else that's downstream of that. How do you take the electrical energy, convert it to you know, shaft power on a uh, propeller, if you will? What's the size, weight, efficiency, fault tolerance, thermal management, a lot of system integration type questions. So technology is the one of the biggest hurdles. Um, but the other two I mentioned were, you know, you can't lose sight of the fact that this needs to be safe enough and you can prove that to the regulatory body, right? The FAA needs to certify your product. That will take time. Uh, not only time, it needs people to build and test this, you know, take it through some kind of a life testing on the ground first, you know, shake it out, uh, build multiple units, get some statistics around it. So all that is again additional effort. And then at the end it's about um, you know, commercial viability, mm. right? getting the, the cost down to something the market will accept. So what has your research been primarily in terms of electric propulsion system? Yeah, so it's on the first part obviously, right? yeah. technology. Yeah. And so my background is in electrical machines. So that's what I've done in the last 20, 30, 20 years. Um, so I come into this field uh, focused on the energy conversion. So going from electrical to mechanical. Sure. Right. So if you bring in a, a cable with, you know, here is the electric power, but I want to create thrust and you know, if you go to physics, there are many different ways you can go from electrons to thrust. Like I said, space electric propulsion are different, different ways of doing propulsion. But the most effective way to do that um, in, in air is to use the same techniques, you know, get a, a propeller, a fan, push air backwards and get thrust, right? So the electric machine is the, that that's the magic. Take the electrical energy, convert to mechanical power, and then provides to the shaft. So that's what my focus has been, and to address all those all those goals, right? Make them uh, power dense, right? um, kilowatt per kilogram. Mm. Get to the levels that um, those large electric air, large aircraft can be electrified. Are you looking into like different? battery compositions or which battery composition is are you finding to be more feasible for this kind of use? Okay, so that goes back to that earlier discussion about, so the, the I think of it as two big pieces. Where is the energy coming from? That's the battery. Right. I don't do much in that. I don't do anything in that, right? So we get to work with colleagues that focus on the energy storage, right? You store the energy in a battery. Uh, by the way, I, I would expand that to say, not just batteries, right? It could be fuel cells, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, many people think, at least as you scale up in in vehicle size, the fuel cells are, you know, say hydrogen fuel cell, maybe more a better solution than just pure batteries, right? or, or a combination of those two, right? Um, so the other people are working on that, right. and the other, the second piece is taking that energy and converting it and sending it to the fan. Mm -hmm. So that's where I come in. And we are looking at many different approaches. Um, near term is, you know, permanent magnet machines. Um, we use the term conventional because the other type of machine we are looking at is superconducting, which we can get to later. But the Conventional machines are not unlike what you have in uh, EVs, right? Um, electric cars, but a very different load profile, uh, very different requirement in terms of, again, weight and uh, fault handling capability. Right? So those are the different approaches. We, once you go back to a lot of the research you've done with like the superconductors and everything else, yeah. but I do want to ask, more, I do want to, I'm curious and in, in more, in a, I'm really interested in knowing a little bit more of your background. So, you were born 
No, you're here. What happened in between? <laughs> I was born in uh, very far away from here, right, in an island off the coast of India called Sri Lanka, which, by the way, is in the news these days for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> the economy is going through some tough times and Anyway, that's a topic for a different show, right? <laughs> so I was born in Sri Lanka, but when I was young, the family moved to um, to Nigeria, West Africa. So that's where I grew up, when did my schooling there. I uh, went to college in a place called the University of Ife, in a city called Ife, Ile Ife. Um, finished up, that was in electronics and electrical engineering, like ECE here, or double E. Um, spent a year working road construction. So it's an unusual job for uh, an electrical engineer, mm. right? It's, um, I was what they call a site engineer, the engineer that kind of looked after a site for a stretch of a highway we were working on. Um, they were basically looking for someone, you know, we're not doing Maxwell's equations in that. It's basically logic and common sense type things. There's a large team of people that are executing on, on a plan, right? The road was designed. Now you lead this group of about 300 workers, you know, foremen, technicians, um, labor, machine operators, in uh, getting the road built. Anyway, I did that for a year, um, and then uh, got the itch to get back to what I s studied, electrical engineering. So came to the U.S. for graduate work, which I did at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which you may have heard about. New York. Yeah. New York, okay, there you go. Uh, upstate New York, in Troy, New York. Um, so that was, what, 95, 1995. Finished up my PhD. So that's kind of when I got into this uh, area that I work on now, electrical machines, right? So my advisor, Professor Shep Salon, um, specialized in elect electric machines. Then I got a job at uh, GE Research, about 15 minutes west of uh, RPI um, in a place called Schenectady, right? This was the corporate um, R&D center for GE. GE, by the way, you know, it's um, back then was the go-to place for people like us, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it was the, um, I don't know, the Google, Google or Tesla of the, of the day, right? I mean, you go there, you get to work on exciting problems, electric power, renewables, right? Um, transportation, aviation, you know, GE did all of those, right? All the different divisions of those, of the company. Spent uh, 13 years there. And the nice thing about GE research is that um, you're in the same place but you get to work on all these topics I talked about. One day you're building a machine for a, um, a CT scanner, right? So GE is um, medical systems business. Another day it's the starter generator for a uh, Boeing aircraft, right? And uh, wind turbines. So oh, another day you could be looking at the power generator for a nuclear power um, power turbine, right? So, like, you know, hundreds of megawatts or gigawatt of power, right? So that was incredible experience for me. You know, there's, there were so many experts out there. So I would say, so you learn at school and then you go to really learn, right, <laughs> at work. You know, people with decades of experience have done all kinds of things in their careers, right? So, um, really got to learn from some of the giants of the field. Right? Uh, then, 
decided I'll try out academia. Um, so 2014 is when I moved here. There's a center here called the Granger Center for Electric Machines, Machinery and Electromechanics. Have either of you run into this? Come across this at all? No, we no? Okay. I've seen the, uh, the name. Yeah. Yeah. Granger CME is one of the largest endowed centers in electrical engineering, mm -hmm. right? So the Grangers, who now our college is now named after, um, set up the center to do research on electric machinery. And since it's an endowed center, you are not at the mercy of um, some funding agency or, you know, what's what's the topic that's popular today? You, you get to really sit down and dream up ideas and take on big challenges and you can work on all those long-term pr projects under the center, right? So that was the big draw for me over here. Um, you know, a couple of professors here, um, Pete Sauer, Phil Krein, had worked with the Grangers to set this up you know, going back 20 years ago. So I, I knew about the center even when, when I was at GE. So if there's a place I would move to, it would be Illinois, right, just because of that. So I came here, worked on, um, so again, because we could take on those long-term problems, you know, looked around and electric aircraft, seemed like one of those topics that you know it may take 10 20 years to to figure out and mature uh, so got started on that and here i am eight years later right almost a decade <laughs> almost a decade that's right so when i say you know i should probably go back and qualify what i said about you know it's, you asked how long before we see electric proportion so you know the question sounds simple, but right. it's very nuanced, right? Yeah. You can get one of these flying much sooner um, just to learn from that. Is that the final product? Uh, is that the um, TRL-9, if you're familiar with t technology readiness levels? You know, you, you go up, you, you have an idea, then you prove it out in the lab, then you prove it in the relevant environment, and then you keep building it and testing it and before it becomes truly mature, right? You can fly an electric airplane anywhere along that path, not anywhere, I mean, towards the higher end of the TRL um, ladder, um, but you want to be mature before it's a commercial product, right? So I would, I would say, now it's not just engineering, it's funding, is there money and are the right people interested in getting out this out? But the technology could be ready a lot sooner. That's what I would say. And that's the, uh, the exciting part because sometimes it's the engineering that is preventing us from making progress. Yeah. And I would say perhaps the funding one issue is still pretty hard, but perhaps a little easier. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's easier or harder, but it's, it's a different <laughs> problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, luckily for us, I think, so this wasn't true 10 years ago. Right. When you know, we were starting work on this, it was a, is it feasible, you know, let the techies work on it type thing. But just in the last, I want to say, three, four years, um, as people are demonstrating the technologies, I think there's enough excitement that's built up. So beyond the government funding, which was our traditional source of funds for this kind of work, there's a lot of uh, VC, venture capital funding, there are a number of companies that have gone um, public, right? So they've gone, you know, IPOs in the, just the last, I want to say, year or two even, right? Um, so maybe to your point, in this climate, this time, um, funding does look like it's there, right? Um, but then what problem do we solve, right? So you go from a government agency deciding, okay, what are the big challenges and working on it to a world where 
the funding is mostly uh, venture capitalist driven, the considerations may be different, right? One committee may want to have nearer term results. The, the appetite for, you know, if you say 10 years, you know, they may or may not have the appetite for, to wait that long, that long, right? So, I will mention one more thing. So, why is our group working on the large airplanes, right? So, the little ones are obviously easier and we do need to get those flying and learn from those. But what's the motivation? We want to do electric airplanes not because we can, because it solves some problem, right? And what's the big challenge in the aviation industry today? It's the, the grand challenge, if you will, is to make them emission free, right? right? Decarbonize aviation. Mm -hmm. So if, if that's the goal, then you look at where the carbon impact is, turns out about 90% of the emissions are from aircraft uh, uh, like the single aisle and up. The Boeing 737 class and up is where 90% of the carbon impact is. So if you took all the general aviation, GA type aircraft, four seaters or eight seaters, so if you electrified all of them, you would have a less than 10% impact, which we should do, and we should get started there. But until you're electrifying the large aircraft, you're not making enough of a dent. Um, so that's why we're working on that, on the problem. And um, where's the funding? That's again a topic for a, di a different show, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we get to work on all of the classes of aircraft. And you're working on one that you could describe as all electric, all electric uh, cryogenic, okay, uh, liquid hydrogen. Yes, um, it's a long word. So <laughs> I'm probably going to get it wrong, but you've been funded by a lot of organizations, NASA included. Yes, I think um, not DARPA, but uh, someone similar. Someone yeah, similar. we well, uh, so you know, we get support from many different agencies. So I, um, I, I think we are lucky. Right, this is the right time to work on this problem. Um, so one thing we get to do is uh, we get to work on nearer term technologies as well as longer term technologies. So the program ref you are referring to is what I would put in the longer term category. It's um, for large aircraft and if you want to make them, so go back to the discussion about um, batteries are going to be hard to replace all the energy in those large aircraft, right? So you could do hybrid, but then they're not going to be zero emission because you still have a lot of um, carbon-based fuel. If you truly want zero emission, then you can wait for batteries to advance enough to get energy dense, but you know, the, the trajectory is, doesn't look promising. Um, but if you could carry the fuel as hydrogen and using a fuel cell mm. and what you get is you know n not much more than water vapor at, at the at the tail um, which itself has questions about contrails and so on but let's ignore that for now um, if you if you could use the hydrogen to power the aircraft and you know you could burn the hydrogen in a turbine and get power that way or you could go electric and we are following the latter approach, right? Hydrogen electric aircraft. And uh, hydrogen is light, but is very low density. Uh, let me rephrase that. <laughs> they probably say the same thing, low density. What I meant to say is it's um, volumetric. It, uh, the energy density, volumetric energy density is poor. Right. The gravimetric density, uh, energy per kilogram, is very high, right? So the, um, so the challenge is how do you get the volume? So people are looking at compressing it and you know, storing in very high pressure is one way to do that. The other is to liquefy it. So you go liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen. Um, so then you ask the question, all right, 
liquid hydrogen you are storing it at the hydrogen boils off at ambient pressure at 20 Kelvin right. right so really low temperatures and then you ask the question okay is there some way is there some synergy between storing that at liquid hydrogen temperatures and the powertrain and you say okay if that kind of temperature is available in the aircraft if you can use the liquid hydrogen as the heat sink maybe you can cool the powertrain down to those temperatures or approaching 20 Kelvin and now you can consider superconducting right. technologies right so that's very exciting mm. um, and that's the approach we're taking can we make a practical superconducting drivetrain that's you know everything from the output of the fuel cell the power distribution cables the electric motor and if there's power electronics you know they are not superconducting they're semiconducting but they could still be cryogenically cooled power electronics and that's the research question is there a practical solution out there can the design close meaning um, you have the system that has some losses this heat soaking in you're cooling with the fuel but you only have a limited amount of hydrogen that you're taking as fuel right you don't want to take extra hydrogen just to be able to cool your drivetrain so that's the balance we are seeking but like it will be tricky to like get the hydrogen stay at that temperature right because you're if you're working with liquid hydrogen and as you mentioned the, bo the boiling point is like pretty low yeah. so I'm pretty sure it's like very expensive first to get <laughs> hydrogen at, um, liquid hydrogen first of all sourcing it so how would that factor in with what you're working with or how, yeah. how, how would you work on that challenge? Right, so there's a whole um, trend, um, there's a whole industry around hydrogen, right. right? You may have heard the term hydrogen economy, mm -hmm. right? So there's people that believe that, um, you know, if, if you can generate energy through renewables um, and if you get to use it right away in the power grid, that's good. But if there are periods where you're producing extra and there are periods where you need energy, then you need to store that somehow. Battery electric, uh, batteries are one. The other is with hydrogen. So regardless of what happens in aviation, there are people working on storing hydrogen. Uh, first of all, generating hydrogen, right? It could be by, you know, and, um, What's the term? You break water into hydrogen and oxygen using the energy from renewables. And the best way to store, not the, the best way, one way to store would be as liquid hydrogen and you can transport it um, quite easily. You asked a question about the, the cost. Yes, costs need to come down, but they are on a good trajectory. It's not unlike where, say, uh, solar panels were. 10, 20 years ago. They were expensive, but you know, they were coming down. And I think if you project forward, um, they could be at levels that are reasonable for an application like aviation. The second piece of that is how do you store it and keep it at, at that temperature, right? Yeah, and that's you know part of the engineering. You have to store them in, in vessels that are insulated, mm. right? You know, basically like a cryostat. It's you know, there's um, inside is 20 Kelvin, outside is ambient, and the delta T is in the you know in the in the vessel, the walls of the vessel, and getting them. The the traditional way we have done it is in fairly heavy um, liquid hydrogen tanks. So if you take what people use today and put an airplane, that's not going to work. So one of the research areas is lightweight liquid hydrogen tanks, you know, composites and special liners and um, so that is being addressed, that's mm -hmm. what I would say. The second piece is that this hydrogen, we are going to use it in a fuel cell, right? So it's being fed into this, um, into the cells as gaseous hydrogen mm -hmm. so they're not going in as liquid so they do boil so we, we take it out of the tanks 
they warm up and then they're fed into the fuel cell. As they are warming up, that is the, um, that is the stage where they're cooling the powertrain, right. meaning the heat from the powertrain is going into this hydrogen mm. and boiling off. Right. So finding the balance between all of those is the engineering challenge. Right. Would you be able to, I mean, I'm sure you have seen the MTD buses running around campus, they, yeah. which are like, they, they run on hydrogen fuel, right? And I recently got the chance to visit their facility where they make the hydrogen. So I was learning about the fuel cell and uh, how like the, like the only exhaust is like water vapor, yep. like water. Mm -hmm. So um, would that be able, like help in some way to the aviation, like getting water, like eventually once you, it passes through the fuel cell and. Yeah. Um, so, the, it's basically the same technology, yeah. right? What they're using the, the buses. And I, I don't know this for a fact, but I assume they're um, storing the hydrogen as compressed, um, in a compressed high pressure yeah, gas. They're using, right? Yeah, they're using gas. For right, them. not liquid, right? Yeah. Right. So, and, and people can do the same for, for aircraft. And like I said, our program is on liquid hydrogen. So, but the rest of it is, is similar. It's, um, you know, there's a fuel cell, you, you have hydrogen as an energy source, there's electric power that comes out, and you, you drive your, your fan, electric fan, electric propulsor, if you will, with that. Uh, so there's a lot to be learned from terrestrial applications. Mm. Um, you know, there are unique requirements for aircraft, and weight is the primary one. So what works for the bus may not work for aircraft. So getting the the and the power density of the fuel cell and the energy density of your hydrogen storage system becomes key questions. The other big question is, and this is somewhat um, not an uh, not immediately obvious, is that I think the fuel cells are getting better, but right now what you can procure up efficiency is maybe sixty percent. Also, meaning 40% of the energy is lost as heat, mm. right? And maybe this goes up to 70, 80%, but it's still, um, let's say 20% of it is heat. Um, so if you have a, an aircraft that needs, I don't know, 40 megawatts of power, like those 50 passenger type aircraft, um, at any given point in time, 20, 30, 40 percent of that, so 20 megawatts, there's a way to do this math, 20 percent of uh, 40 megawatts is what, 8 megawatts, and if it were 40 percent, that's 16 megawatts, um, it's coming out as heat. Um, it's it's going to take some engineering to exhaust that heat to the ambient. Otherwise, your fuel cells and everything on the airplane just start warming up, right? Um, you may ask the question, hey, don't we already do that? The jet engines, they, um, they also lose about 40% of the power, but they operate at a much higher temperature, and most of that lost energy is coming out of the, as the exhaust, right? So the hot air is coming out of the back of the, of the engine. So in two ways, we are changing it. A similar amount of heat may be coming out, but the fuel cells don't operate at thousands of degrees, at least the polymer fuel cell that we are looking at. Um, and the heat is not dumped into the exhaust, right? It's, it's being lost in the, in the fuel cell. So you may need some kind of a a radiator, uh, some way to get that heat out without creating a lot of drag in the aircraft. So that's one area that the team is working on. So you started a company based on this research called Kinetics. Right. And your, the mission of the company is to make avi aviation carbon free. But I'm curious because, like you said, a company versus research, they both have different incentives. Yeah. In a company, well, they, you know, you could get funding from 
VC, venture capitalists, and when you're a researcher, you get funding from the NIH, the government in general. So you have different incentives. Why do you think starting a company is the right way to push this technology? And what's the story behind it? Okay, yeah, so, um, like I said earlier, just having a technology doesn't mean that it's a product is going to come out of it, right? right? So between the technology and a product is all the thing we talked about, showing that it's maturing the technology, going up the TRL ladder, um, having the capability, I mean, making it manufacturable, making it reliable, getting the cost down to a level that the market would would find acceptable. Those are not necessarily questions that we answer exhaustively, at least in in the academia, right? We, we are more excited about the the earlier part of it. Can we get this working? Establishing feasibility, coming up with new new solutions. Um, and as we started doing that, we got a lot of interest from potential industry partners, industry and government partners. But there was a gap, right, between the showing the feasibility in a lab versus getting it ready to put on an actual system that would fly. Um, so that's, so out of necessity is why we launched this company. Let's have this venture take the technologies that are coming out of the research labs and getting it a point that people would, you know, seriously consider putting in a vehicle, right? So that's what we try to do. We have tried to stay focused on the, the same goals that we have on campus, right? We are not necessarily looking to, um, we're not letting money drive our decisions. And we're still focused on decarbonizing aviation, looking at the larger aircraft. So the products that the company is looking at is the megawatt class machines. And you know, one megawatt up to say 10 megawatts which is not very, not immediately needed for the smaller aircraft that people are looking at commercially right now. Um, so this is really a product for the future. Um, so that's what the, why we decided to do this, right? The, uh, let me go to some other aspects of having a, we are also deciding consciously to stay here on campus. So the company is physically based in the research park, um, which may or may not be the best decision if you're trying to do this as a business, right? You want to have a, an ecosystem around you, um, especially if you have a, you know, this is a, unlike a software startup where, you know, you could be anywhere and scale up. If you want to build large machinery, you need the right kind of vendors and shops which are maybe easier to find in Chicago or Detroit or you know, el elsewhere. But we're choosing to stay here because we, we think this is a kind of a win-win situation between the university and this venture. We have students working here. A lot of people that work in the company are interns and part-time employees that are actually students here. Um, in my mind, it's experiential learning. Right, so it's how I learned. Right, I learned at school, but most of my learning came from working at uh, at the GE Research Center. So, if students can do a little bit of both, even when they are at school, so that's not a bad thing. Right? So, it's working out really, really great. That from the start point. Guys, will you guys build a some type of uh, aircraft at some point? <laughs> we are a a piece of an aircraft. Right. right, it's been hard for this little company to build an aircraft, but the intention is uh, is exactly to get to that point where there is an aircraft, but in partnership with others. Right. So we are looking at both industry partners as well as uh, government partners. Right. NASA has many different programs where they do flight demos, and we would like to participate in some of those. I would, um, I would really appreciate if you, if you write me down, not on the first one, but maybe in the second or third <laughs> one, uh, to, to see what it's like. 
You know, yeah. I'm, I'm curious. So, we're going to space. Yeah. And there's been a lot of effort with the space. Do you think, I actually don't know if anyone has used any type of electric propulsion system in space, but do you think it could be used? Because, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of, like, you know, normal rockets. I think at some point someone did some type of, like, nuclear type of uh, rocket-based type of thing. Has anyone done any type of, like, electric? Yeah, in, in fact, you know, so going back to my point about electric propulsion, the aerospace industry, that's what they're more familiar with, at least 10 years ago. I mean, now, the, even what we do is, um, uh, and everybody's aware of it, space has been doing electric propulsion for a long time, right? So what does propulsion mean in space? If you take a fan and spin it, you're not going to move because there's no air, <laughs> right? So, uh, they have to look at other ways to propel themselves. And you may look at, you know, ways to create um, some flow of, I mean, you can take something from down here, a little tank of some gas or whatever, and then release it right. and get it, create a little bit of jet and propel yourself forward. Uh, or you could do it electrically um, by um, ionizing um, some fluid and then accelerate it with electric fields and again propel forward. So that's the traditional electric propulsion in space. So that's, you know, well known and is, is being done. Between the two, going from here to space, yeah. where the rockets come in, that's um, extremely hard, right? You need a lot of uh, thrust. Mm -hmm. But who is to say that can't be some type of electric in the future? I mean, it's um, hard for us to imagine that now, but that's why we're here, right? To dream, dream big, take on challenges. I see a lot more um, lower hanging fruit, if you will, mm -hmm. in electrifying aircraft um, before we get into what would a, the rocket of the future look like? I don't know. Maybe some of you guys would explore that. Yeah, I, th I do think it would be interesting to start some sort of uh, companies to do a space infrastructure uh, because, you know, SpaceX, you know, they're doing a lot of the like transportation, but we're going to need a lot of infrastructure there. We're yeah. going to need some type of like Uber or like hotels <laughs> or like some, uh, so many things. Uh, I mean, there, there's been a couple of companies doing manufacturing in space, yeah. which would be interesting. So it is exciting. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if it's in this, in the time frame that will impact me, but certainly in the time frame. I mean, in your are future. you planning to die like, <laughs> soon or something? I think, I think the future is pretty close. It's close? Okay. Well, in our case, it depends on what, right? So people talk about mining, people talk about you know, living on Mars, for example. Uh, manufacturing space, yes. Yeah, I, I think, look, that is the future. I hope I get to see that, <laughs> right? I, I hope so too. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I stay healthy enough that someone will take me on a rocket ship somewhere. I, would you like to go to, to space at some point and perhaps, you know, the moon, you know, Mars, yeah. because, you know, that will be about, actually, I don't know, but space in general, is, is, that, is that something you would be interested in? And well, there are days when... Uh, I mentioned to you before the program, I have three daughters. There are days I wish I could get on a, <laughs> on a rocket <laughs> ship and go somewhere else to another planet. Um, look, who wouldn't want to go? Who? Well, I don't know. I, I think it would be exciting, right, to go, yeah. to go out there into space. I would love to do that. I would like to come back. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm adventure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there are people that are planning to go live there, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not one of those, so <laughs> I would want to go to space, experience it, look down on Earth, and maybe come back. <laughs> Does yeah. that, so you've worked it a lot with sustainable, sustainability, right? And your research has been in pushing that boundary forward, just getting us a little bit closer to um, getting net zero or getting carbon neutral or getting the emissions down, right? Um, is space civilization something that um, like stands out to you? Because what like many people like Elon Musk are trying to do is just colonize another planet and 
because they think that humans are should be an interplanetary species, right? And Earth, we need to let it go at some point. But all our efforts are being put, like our primary efforts need to be put into still keeping Earth a habitable place. So how, how, what's your thought about this? Um, I think we should do both, right? Um, I mean, so it's, it's a, here's a practical issue, right? So we talked about time frame. Um, how quickly could we become an interplanetary species, or race or whatever, right? Um, I mean, if you're an optimist, it could be quick. I think most people think it's going to be... Or if you're a billionaire. <laughs> Or, or if, if you're a billionaire, billion, you <laughs> think. But as, as a species, I mean, the, the billions of people that we have on Earth, right? We're not going to get on a rocket ship and fly out of here next year, right? Or right. 10 years, um, maybe in 100 years, right? So, look, this is the uh, only home we have now. Exactly. So we have to keep this, keep this uh, habitable and you know, nice environment for us. It doesn't mean we don't invest in that future, right? But well, one thing I will say is this, that throughout history, I shouldn't be making big statements. So I'm an engineer, right? But, you know, maybe I'll put myself out there. And I say um, sustainability, I think there's a school of thought that we should um, do less. Let me explain what I mean. Um, so, for example, aviation, I mean, that some people think, you know, aviation produces emissions, we should uh, fly less, right? Um, take a sailboat or whatever, right? And I, I understand that and I appreciate where they're coming from. And maybe now, since there's no alternative, that's what we should do. Um, so, what's, what do people say? You want to conserve uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. recycle, right? So the first thing is reduce. Um, I am of the opinion that we are, we are truly blessed. There's abundant energy out there. Mm. Um, we just need to figure out how to do that in a way that's healthy and safe for the environment. Um, I mean, and yes, today I agree, we don't have a zero carbon aircraft, but our future should be um, not reducing flights. I would even counter that and say we should be flying more. I mean, we, every, we should democratize flights. We, it should be uh, available to everyone. We should be able to fly across the world. We should be able to fly to the next town. Um, why not enjoy the fruits of technology, right? So why am I going through this example? Is same thing with with space. I mean, we should be um, going 100 miles per hour, or whatever, full speed ahead on on um, conquering space, traveling to other planets. But don't destroy our only home when right, we do not that. Not at the cost of. Not at the cost of. Yeah. Other, right? And I think it's a lazy solution when people say, I'll do less. I think in the reality, we should do a lot of more research, engineering, yeah. as a way to solve the problem. And like, oh, do less, or like, no, like that's the lazy solution, and that should not be. The yeah. solution should be having more research, and, and perhaps even more basic research, where we give researchers a lot of money to follow their curiosity and to do what they wish in a way that they're, like, they don't feel restrained by, okay, you need to do an incremental change in your variables so you can post the paper so you can see them better whatever so i think you know a, a solution i don't know it could be that okay you're saying that like okay pay more for the flights so we can give the money to researchers or whatever or like get more money to but i think in general giving more money to researcher without having a you know sp explicit purpose in three years i need you to publish three papers that's completely like insane or you know in three years give me this so i think like imagine, it's, it's like you said, you left GE because you wanted to come to this place, a Granger, where you don't have to rely on, on funding. You could, you were, you have the ability to work on long-term projects. I don't know how, tr how true that is, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming it's more true than, than false. Um, 
but in a way, I think those are the things we, we need to have and I think follow what, you know, but like Vannevar Bush did in the 1940s with FDR and all those type of efforts. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, so, w w you know, we, we always talk about money, but money is only one part of it. The other big piece, and that's why I love being here at, at Illinois, is, um, you know, kindling that, that spirit of innovation in the next generation, right? So um, how to get an army, a large army of engineers, scientists out there that are highly motivated, they, I mean you, you all, are going to come up with all the solutions, right? So if we can light that spark, I think when you ask a question about how soon can you have uh, electric airplanes, I mean, I, I'm sensing that excitement, right? That you all want to make this happen. So I, I, I feel good. I think, I think we are creating the right kind of people in the next generation to solve all these issues. How has having kids, or as you mentioned, like you have three daughters, right, changed or influenced your outlook on sustainability and, and making this happen as soon as possible? I, I, like, I would like to say that I have had time to think about all this. Once you have kids, you're, you're living day to day, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let me see. Uh, um, Look, you don't need to have your own kids. I mean, you, um, as a species, um, I, you know, as you age, you look, the, there is another generation behind you. Um, obviously, I personally am, you know, emotionally attached to my kids. But as humanity, we, uh, it's clear, we need to move to a very sustain, I mean, sustainable future, say, say the planet. I mean. Uh, someone, not someone, I mean, previous generations handed the earth to us, right? I mean, they, it, whether they intentionally or whether they, um, how, how do I frame it? I mean, pe people came before us and we still have the earth to live on. We don't want to be the last few generations that live on a habitable planet. There's going to be many, many generations after us. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously having, having kids brings that home, uh, brings that home. Yeah, like makes, makes this fun. issue more personal. More right? personal, that's right. Yeah. It'll, they'll be inheriting this earth. Yeah. If, like, the more efforts you put in at this point, the better it might be in the future, right? Yeah. Because you're just, you just, getting us a little a little closer to to maybe not like total devastation in the future right so yeah i mean it's something that i think about a lot because um the people who have done this damage like in the past few years are not going to be here to face the effects of the consequences right and um there's not much that we can do to change that because the irreversible changes have already set uh, like already already said and the only thing we can do is first to adapt better to it just to learn to adapt better to it and at this point start undo not undoing but changing how we have been doing things like um like the fossil fuel industry let's say for example we it's the primary source of energy right for most of the earth right now because just because it has had so many years to develop and like now it's at a point where it's the cheapest source of energy until we get all solar or renewables down to the like to a comparable price where you can switch it so like it's always the challenge of changing what has already already been set in stone and i think that's that's the difficult part and how quickly we manage to do that is is going to matter a lot yeah i mean clearly there are entrenched parties, right, right. Uh, players. Uh, I'll just mention that in many places, solar and wind is already cheaper right, than right. fossil fuel, right? Um, but then there may be other considerations is uh, the whole question of dispatchability, right? I mean, what happens when the sun is not shining or wind is not blowing? But even that's being, people are working on it. 
so I'm very optimistic. There will always be, you know, anytime there's change, you know, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> there, there are people that may not do as well as others in a, in a changing world. And um, we just had to figure out, now we are going away from engineering, so politics or how as a society we deal with deal with that but there's no no option we have we have to yeah. uh, you know let's think to do something together here so you're an advisor of the Illini air shuttle uh, thing and you know I, I, I did take a look at quad day and you know they're doing this thing they're doing this paper and that's that's all cute that's very cute uh, are they actually gonna build something I'll be honest I don't know. Uh, that, that is to say, that, they're that's building a, something already. Right. That, that's, yeah. that, that's very nice. Okay. Um, let's say I actually want to, let's say we actually want to do it like quickly and we're not doing our stuff. We're not doing meetings every week. We're not writing cute papers. We actually want to do something and like launch it and have it ready. First would be, is that something that we could do like regulation wise, technology wise, building an air shuttle from Champaign-Urbana to Chicago? Is that feasible? Do we have the regulation? Second, if we have the regulation, if it's technologically feasible and everything else, why aren't we doing it already? Okay. Money, like, what is it? Okay, I think you're bringing up a good point. So the Island Eye Air Shuttle, so you plug whoever's watching, they should go check it out. Maybe there's a website. It's, um, the goal is to have a an electrical vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, um, zero emission for um, distances like between Champaign and Chicago, right? So that's what this club is focused on. It's not technically feasible today because of the payload and, and range, right? So I said you can do electric airplanes and even EV toll, electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft for smaller payload and low, uh, um, lower ranges, it's possible today. So what's the, the barrier is energy density of the energy source, like batteries, if you're going to do batteries, and the power density of the complete drivetrain, right? The machines drives power electronics that we are working on. Um, so that's why we think this is a long-term project but we should be, we, we don't want to wait for the technology to become available before we engage a broader group of people that, you know, kind of grow with the technology, that are thinking about, um, is this even the right vehicle? Do we want, I mean, I'll ask you a question, is, is it better to have, like the automotives, you know, you carry two people on average, is what the, the car does, right, on average, maybe even less than two, I think is, if you take, all the cars out there, how many people per car? Uh, do we want to fly like that? Or is it better to have 20 people, like a, like a bus? Um, I don't know the answer. I, mean, I feel like there's some um, benefits to carrying a larger group of people, I mean, especially if you need to have a pilot and um, there are fixed costs associated with flying one, one vehicle. So uh, where am I going with all this? Many other questions beyond just technology. Even, um, I'll, I'll throw another one out at you. So, uh, social, uh, society, uh, um, what's the term? H how does the society view a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft? Let's say there is a solution out there that only a tiny sliver of the population can afford it, right? And that tiny sliver of people, the 0.01% of the society, uh, you know, flying from the suburbs, going to, um, you know, downtown, doing their banking, whatever, and flying back. And the 99.99% is, you know, sitting there watching from a traffic jam, right? Logged in there <laughs> for three hours. How would that play out, right? Uh, uh, it's a question. I don't know the answer, uh, right? I mean, I just quickly, I think. That's completely fine. You charge them as much as possible so we can actually fund the other stuff for, for later. Okay. So that's that's one solution, right? So meaning um, there must be a way for... Okay. I don't, I, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. All right. So my, my <laughs> point is, 
just having the technology solution by itself, and we should be thinking about broader uh, issues. How do you charge these things? How, I mean, where would they land? Uh, should we uh, make spaces available um, for this tiny uh, population to go land? Or should we instead invest in a, a train? I mean, should we have high-speed train between Chicago and here that can serve a larger group? I don't know the answers to that, but I, I think we need to engage a broader group of people in this kind of discussions. So that's another reason to have a, an RSO where we have engineers, but we also have social scientists and business majors, everybody engaged. Let me get to the second part of your question about uh, why aren't we doing it? Well, one is the technology is not available, but I think you, you're hitting on something important. You, you learn by doing, right? You don't learn by sitting in a room and thinking, <laughs> well, Maybe let's some get, things you can learn. Let, let, you know, <laughs> let's write papers. Let, 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 let's have two-hour weekly meetings. So. Yeah. So in engineering, you definitely want to. I mean, there are some other fields you could learn by sitting and chatting and so on. But in our field, you <laughs> you definitely want to build, test, break, right. improve, build again. So I'm taking a note, right? Mental note that I should go back to this eyeliner air shuttle. Um, should we have a parallel effort on things you could do today, right? Maybe a single passenger mm -hmm. aircraft, even if that's not the ultimate goal, maybe uh, maybe you would be excited to go build something and test it, right? Like I, I would be highly excited like to do whatever I can to get funding to figure it out, <laughs> just to make something. Yeah. Like, okay, maybe it's not Champaign, Chicago, because the energy density, power density, all of that. Maybe you can just go start from, okay, the minimum possible. You could do it a la, you know, Wright Brothers style. You go from here to Rantoul. And like just make it that it barely works. And maybe you, you wouldn't even put a human. You put something in there. You just make it fly. If it falls, you know, make it in a field so it doesn't hurt anyone. Yeah. But I think we just try, like, okay, the science is, is cute. It's great. The papers are amazing, whatever. But why aren't we just building stuff and just let it be broken? It sounds like you should be joining this club and uh, <laughs> participating in. So yeah, it just the, the meeting hurt too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I will say this. So um, since I'm the faculty advisor, I'm, I'm taking this feedback. I don't take it personal, by the way. Not just personal, <laughs> but no, it, it, I'm taking the feedback, and I will indeed share that with the broader group. I I think they are they are doing, um, or at least they have plans to work in that direction and and maybe um, art articulating that plan would be helpful because there is a sub team or a small group that's out there demonstrating not even ran tool to here a little um, unmanned aircraft there are many things you can learn with the subscale demonstrator and they did fly something uh, even just a few weeks ago or maybe a few months ago right which I saw so they, they are doing that. They, it's a um, RSO, meaning I'm just an advisor. It's a student-driven um, club. Even deciding what to do, the process by which you decide is a learning process. Right? How to work in a team, how do you rally the troops into a plan. You, you have an idea. Others may have a different idea. Um, so... Uh, don't give up. Go back there. Make a case. Yeah, for, maybe, maybe. I, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know which one would be the best way to actually make it forward. Because, like, something I think about, you know, college, like this place is so unique, and I want to see, like, especially engineering people, like builders, people who are going to build the future. Like, who cares about a job? Who cares about, you know, I we should be building like crazy things. Like, like I should be walking on the quad or engineering quad, and I should be seeing. This little thing flying, or like, oh, it just broke. Okay, fine, we'll go fix it. I should be seeing like, I don't know, autonomous like self-driving things. I should be seeing a bunch of like engineering things that we could do, and everyone's just in the library studying and like, test, test, test. And like, I think an exciting future would be where, I don't know, a bunch of people are just out there building things, and we're just walking and we just live in this kind of like futuristic like city, and we see just random things like, oh my god. What is that? Oh, it's a thing flying. Or like, what is a thing? It's like, I don't know, like trees that grow in one day. I, crazy stuff. And it's so hard because 
how, you know, you want to do something? Yeah, let, let's make an RSO so I can be the president, so I can put it on my resume, or like, I can let's have meetings so I can be like, yeah. it just, I just don't know which, it's something I think a lot about, is the idea of incentives, right? It's not about the technology, sometimes it is. It's not about the money, it's not, like, all the things can actually be figured out. It's about figuring out the incentives so we can actually get people, in this case would be, okay, we have really smart students that are focused by, you know, jobs, money, you know, working at the FANG or whatever, whatever, whatever. In reality, that's, that's great and that's personal. But I do think how we make the future exciting is when people are following their curiosity, building crazy things. Yeah. And I just don't see that and I just don't know. Okay, um, yeah, I'll tell you this. That is indeed the vision, right? So the Air Shuttle, Air Shuttle is one of the youngest RSOs. There yeah, are yeah, many yeah. others, right? The Eco, Island I, and the Solar Car Project. So. Solar uh, car. This is part of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there are clubs out there building, yeah. and the the vision for Ilana Air Shuttle and, and others is indeed that. And I'm a big believer in this. I, I mentioned earlier in in experiential learning, right? You need to complement what you're learning in class with things that you're doing yourself, building, testing, and all that. I'm totally with you on that. Um, the one thing I would I would suggest is when we say the RSOs are who are the RSOs? Is you. Well. Right? I mean. Maybe. <laughs> uh, it should be you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. of course. You the and, students, uh, yeah. Other, uh, students, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I mean, find like minded people. I mean, we are in probably the best place, or arguably the best place, to do incredible things like this. Go back to Island Air Shuttle or form a new one. If you need resources, come talk to me. Right. Okay, I, I, I do. I, I'm actually. I do want to know your answer. Right. Because everyone is just so busy, like working on, on tests and homework, and people don't have time to actually. Okay. Build That's a different question now, right? So, because uh, I think that people are there. Mm. I think it's limited, but I think you can make the point that people actually exist out there. Um, but everyone is so busy, 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 busy. Okay. Their internships, uh, all like this, maybe distracted, in my opinion, maybe. Uh, okay, the people are there. Like you said, it's a great place to be. Bright people all around. It's not about the people anymore. It's just about who actually wants to build things and not just go to meetings. Like, I'm actually curious on knowing your answer and your experience of like talking to people and working in many different countries and places. Let's say I, I joined the the Alina Turtle team, or I started whatever, whatever. Oh, it, that's solar car, all right. Maybe yeah. That, that completely be, besides the point. Yeah. How do you find people who actually want to build things and not just you know for show? I mean, that's a question about um, about people interacting with people. Yeah, yeah. Um, is a, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know in what circles you move in or who do you meet. Uh, I think in a place like Illinois with 50,000 students, um, ch chances are there is more than one person with that uh, mindset. Um, with that mindset, right? Um, I cannot tell you, you know, go to the of course. Sixth Street or stand, <laughs> hang out at the union, <laughs> right? Um, I have. I, I would. I would venture to say that um, there is some level of uh, self-filtering that takes place when people join some of these clubs and I would start there but I I'm hearing uh, maybe you're not saying maybe you're saying explicitly that you, you have not seen that in some of these clubs is maybe what I'm hearing uh, well I, I am not to tell you like yeah. explicitly and what I'm saying is that a lot of these clubs are not actually doing Things are just meetings. Okay. Uh, maybe. I mean, I think there are some exceptions with some of the car clubs. I think they, they actually, they've done some really, like, cool stuff. But a lot of these clubs are just for I show. Would say, okay, here's what I would say. Um, I have seen clubs that are doing things, right? And solar car comes to mind. I mean, you guys are mm -hmm. building, you 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 want to race in... Uh, Colorado, yeah. Colorado? Yeah, it was, like, like four states, like um, Kansas, New Mexico, it, Colorado. Okay, so there... Okay, here's one example, right? Mm -hmm. So there are clubs, so I will not make a blanket statement and say no one does this, they're just sitting in meetings, right? You need to find the right ones. The second, I would say, uh, same thing we say about 
the nation, if you disagree with the direction of the country, what should we do? There, there are two paths. You either become, you know, be getting bald or you exit. Uh, I would say do the former, right? I mean, uh, it's just, okay, we don't like the, the planet is going, uh, I mean, sustainability question and so on. Look, we, not everyone can just exit, right? We have to fix it. Right? We, we are going to take, and I am volunteering myself. Come chat with me, but don't um, look for ways where you can, what's Obama's uh, words? Um, be, uh, maybe not Obama's words. Make change or something? <laughs> or? Yes, yes, we can or something? Yes, yes, we can. There you go, right. <laughs> so, yes, you can. One, David, you can make an impact. Um, and I'm sure you'll find um, others that can work with you on this. Yeah. So I would disagree with you partly that every club is just sitting there. Meetings. No, I mean, no, yeah. no, I think the one exception are the car clubs. Like, I think a lot of the car clubs, like the, the motorsport one, the solar car, I think that's one of the exceptions I've seen. Okay. And I, I would add... Um, and you may edit this out of <laughs> out of a, uh, recording here, but um, I don't want to be too harsh. But do more than complain. Yeah, yeah. no, no. I mean, give it as hard as you can. Yeah. And I uh, know I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think complaining is fine. But like, okay, how do you actually do it? And right. I, th I'm, yeah. I actually like I saw the aligner air shuttle thing, mm -hmm. and you know, before even you, you know, I knew you were part of it. Like, regardless, I saw it in quad day. And it was very interesting. I wrote my thing. I get the emails and everything. It just... Okay. So let me add this other thing. So even in Eyeliner Air Shuttle, look, you, it's a group of students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're going to have um, different levels of motivation and different levels, different interests and so on. I know there's at least a, a group within that that's building and testing. Um, in fact, they sent me a video just a few weeks ago. That's why I said just recently they flew a small demo. Find that. Find your tribe, because the word that we, we use. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> find your tribe in a place like Illinois, they, uh, you will, you can find those. I will, I will. I think, yeah, I, I, I've thought of different ways about doing that. I think talking to you has re-initiated. Re uh, yeah, like, yeah, like that, um, that idea. Because I, I do think, I don't know how technologically feasible it is, and I think I don't care either. I, that's, that's regardless of the point. Yeah. I think we should do what's exciting. I think something that gets me really excited yeah. is flying. Good. Absolutely. In fact, part of the reason, so we talked, we spent, I don't know how long, uh, wow, more than an hour, right? Maybe. Uh, yeah, okay. So time, <laughs> time relativity. <laughs> okay. Uh. So we talked a lot about technology and research, but our primary mission here, my, uh, as a academic, as a faculty here, is training students. Yeah, if you can come up with the world's greatest machine to electrify airplane, fantastic. But what's more important is to train students and motivate them to go solve the problem, right? I mean, a thousand of you are gonna do a lot more than a small research group here on campus, right, when you go out into the field. And flight is one of those really motivating, exciting, which kid do not look up at an airplane flying and say, wow. Right? And play with the airplanes and play, everything. Play with the airplane. I mean, even, even me at my age, 50 years, now you know how old I am. <laughs> when I watch one of those large Airbus or Boeing aircraft take off, incredible. This big piece of metal, you know, <laughs> gliding, floating into, right. into the air. If that doesn't motivate you as an engineer, I don't know what will. So... Um, I agree with you. I think this is an exciting topic. You can, and then you couple that with all of you. I think you want to. We talked about sustainability. I mean, you, you, you more than even our generation wants to save the planet. Right? You want to leave it in a better shape than you found it. Hopefully, um, you couple those two together. Fantastic research topic to motivate students. Building and testing. Absolutely, we should do more. The piece that you mentioned within the uh, address is where do you find the time? Well, where do you find the time to socialize or <laughs> uh, do other extracurricular activities? That's one piece. But um, 
that's, that's a different topic. The other piece I would say is from a, as an academic, I think is our job to look at the curriculum and say, where can we give students more opportunities to do that? And at, in the College of Engineering, I think we do that reasonably well. You can do that, do better, of course, right? And, and we are continuously revisiting that. But between your um, independent studies, senior design, you could structure a program where you get some credit for this work. So it's not either or. Yes, you need a certain number of credits per semester to graduate. Maybe it's not enough, but there is some hours that you can allocate, get credit, and still build and test. So use that to the max. Yes, yes, I. Yeah, I, I do want to. I actually, I actually, I do want to build this type of um, flying things. And I mean, it's like you said. Like every time I get an airplane, it's like, oh my goodness, how does this work? Like it just. In, I mean, I know the physics and everything. It just. Yeah. Wow! It just. It's just mind blowing, and I think that is just such an exciting thing. And yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe I think at some point, you know, you can try to find people and everything, and I think that would be ideal. But at some point, like if people don't understand or if don't want to do these things, I think it is the example of actually doing it maybe will bring people. And that, that's right. Be the change that you want. Yeah, in the world. To see in the world. To see in the world. Dalai Lama. <laughs> Okay. Oh, it's Mahatma Gandhi. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Mahatma Gandhi. Really? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Well, maybe many people said it. Yeah, who knows. Um, you know, I do want to ask you, you have three, daughter, three daughters, and, you know, you spend a lot of time with young people like us. What advice did you have for a young person today, you know, maybe an engineer, a very person that is motivated, driven? What advice do you have for these people in you know, early high school, I mean, high school, college, about their careers, their future? Or what advice should they ignore? What advice should they ignore? Or, you know, like what advice do you have for them? Okay. For this a smart, driven yeah. person? Look, we talked about a lot of this, right? Uh, find your passion. Here's what I tell my, my kids, and maybe you, my, my students. There are, you know, what you work on is driven by many considerations, right? It's, you know, there's this Venn diagram you may have seen where you want to work in a field where you have the right set of skills and it's a field that's um, there's a need societal need and there's funding and it's it's an area that excites you excited about it right so it's the intersection of those three that you find a good career out of those three, I think you mentioned it earlier, the, the, the money and the funding and the needs, uh, finding someone that needs it, it's not that hard. Uh, the skills that you need, especially in today's world, you know, you can do online learning, or of course you're in the right place to get the right kind of skills. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll come back to that. Yeah. I, I think you are. <laughs> This is one of the best places to be. Yeah, no, I think so. As an engineer, um, the hardest to change is your passion for that topic. Right. Right. So, if there's one advice I will give is to not necessarily say, "Hey, I'm good at doing this," so let me go find a topic there. Oh, this is where the money is. Let me go work on it. Find your passion. The skills and the money will follow. Right. Um, if you're excited about it, you will learn, whether it's through school or watching YouTube videos or finding friends, trying something out at home. Um, so that's one, one thing I would say. What else? Yeah, build, do things as an engineer. And don't give up just because you attended a meeting and they talked a lot. You, uh, okay, <laughs> you want advice? Be the change that you want to see in the world, right? <laughs> That's another piece of advice for free. Uh, what else would I say? Um, there's so many other little things. I, I think finding the right motivation is near the top there. 
work with others. No hint here, but there, <laughs> there are different personalities. Everyone motivated by a different reason. Right. How do you work as a team? Because the, the, the problems of the future are increasingly things that a single person or a single discipline cannot handle. Right? The intersection of disciplines, it's multiple with multiple skill sets. So engineering is becoming, hey, here's a guy sitting in the lab. I mean, there are still problems you can do. A single person with a scope or a software that can solve. But getting the best out of your colleagues in a team, it can be important in engineering going forward. And never stop learning. That's the thing. Other piece of it. Never stop learning, yeah. I mean, you have to keep learning. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all. You asked me what I tell my daughters. You know, I, I go back to the first point. They may or may not even want to be engineers, right? Because they had to find their passion. First, right. right. Yeah. Quick question be, be, before we start ending the, the, the show. I just have to ask you, do you think electric uh, flying cars would be electric? Uh, most, well, you know, assuming that there will be shorter range yeah. and, you know, the, the energy density is probably there somewhat. Uh, yeah, you're probably using the colloquial uh, version of the uh, meaning of the word flying car. What is flying? What do you mean by flying cars? Well, what you would see in, in you know, TV shows and, and things in the, in, in the 80s or okay. 90s. I don't know. So I mentioned E veto, right? Electrical, vertical takeoff and landing. Oh, forget about E, vertical takeoff mm -hmm. and landing. Something that's used in the parking lot, go up into the... Air, fly. Like and back to the future. They go, like back to the future, right? Although back to the future, um, the later ones. Later like, ones. Uh, At the end of the first one, okay. you, you get the All right. vertical. So, y yes. And um, those are mostly electric. And you can you do it without electric? Yes. But I think the industry is voting with their feet that electric is the better solution because that's the majority of the projects are electric. Flying car means a different thing to me. It's a something that can fly, but it's also a car. A car that can drive on the road, right? You want to drive from here to Chicago, yes. And on the way back, you want to fly and come back, right? That, um, it's a more challenging problem because it, it needs to be both a car that's roadworthy and safe and you know, runs on wheels, and it should be light enough and to fly. It's a harder problem to solve. Right? You need, you want the, you're, you're looking for the best of both, but you may end up with the worst of both. Meaning, is neither the neither the best car nor the best airplane, right? Because you're carrying all that extra stuff to do both. Um, those today tend to be um, not as not as electric. Because just because you're carrying a lot of energy around for both, um, in the future they could be electric. But I would uh, at least say this: in the space of urban mobility, I think that's broader term. Uh, oh, shorter range, few people flying, taking off from some place to go to another. Uh, I would bet that they are more likely to be electric in the future. We'll have to see. And Make it happen. <laughs> so to, uh, to end our show, we have a section called overrated, underrated? Overrated, underrated. So, right. so this is the, the first question I want to ask, you know, you, you talked about Back to the Future and ha have you seen the movie? I've seen um, a few times. <laughs> a few times, yeah. It's a quite an interesting movie. Yeah. The flux capacitor, underrated <laughs> or overrated? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, by the way. Right. So they never explain it. Yeah, so it's hard well, for me to answer. Oh, well, imagine, imagine. <laughs> um, you know, it was this, you know, you, you can think it was this thing used for time travel, and also you can think it was uh, this thing used for electric uh, propulsion look, it's, or whatever. It's, it's, um, as an engineer, I say it's overrated. But as a concept in a, in a movie, it's fantastic. Yeah. 
they like mentioned plutonium and for the flux capacity. You know? So it's is there something right now which could you might probably be able to relate or compare it to that what they were trying okay, to remind aim. me what the flux capacity. What did you do in the movie? It provided the energy. Yeah, it was right? basically it was yeah. Source. It was just a time travel juice, you can it's say. A juice. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the closest I can think of <laughs> is some type of nuclear. I mean, in terms of right. like just so much energy in there, um, and some fusion reactor, if you will, <laughs> right? Um, it's the closest I can think of to get a lot of energy in a small package. Hmm. The, the next one we want to ask is uh, Boone Supersonic, which is the, the new era of supersonic planes. Yeah. Underrated or overrated? You're putting me in a tough spot here. <laughs> These are areas I, I want, I am excited about all of this. I, supersonic, um, just that when I do the, the math as an engineer, it's a very inefficient way to fly. So, purely from that standpoint, Today's technology, I would say, is overrated. Okay. But for the future, it's absolutely the way we want to fly. Supersonic? Supersonic, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even faster than that. Even faster than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Instantaneous, right? Instantaneous. What, what's the warp speed? Have you heard of uh, Zoom? Uh, Zoom? Yeah, it's, it's a thing you go on your computer and you like. <laughs> <laughs> Teleport yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of is, in a way. In, yeah. in, a way. in fact, there were, I've been in sessions, not now, you know, going back 10, 20 years ago, you know, this big brainstorming session where you say, what's the future of flight? What are the threats? So if you're a big aviation company, for a Boeing, uh, what are the biggest threats? And you say, oh, is it, is it Airbus? Is it some company out of China? Or is it flying cars? And... Many times you came in and say, no, the biggest threat is uh, teleconferencing. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah, people may decide to live out their lives in a room like this, but experience whatever they want virtually. Yeah. One last one. Yeah. Um, superconductivity. We never came back to it, but. We uh, come to my favorite topic. Yeah. <laughs> totally underrated. Yeah. It's uh, one of the magical things in engineering. It's one of the few quantum mechanical effects that you can see in the macro world. Mm. Right. We are in uh, Homo Bardeen that uh, right. explained the BCS theory. Right. So many connections to superconductivity back here to, to Illinois. It's um, got incredible potential Unfortunately, um, what do they say? It's got, a, it's got a great future and it will always remain that way. <laughs> <laughs> People say we need to make it practical. Um, when we do, it will completely transform uh, the electrical industry as we know it. Right? In terms of everything from efficiency and making things compact, being able to transmit a lot of power, electric airplanes, um, so many other applications, even in just my space, electric power, where superconductivity, of course, transcends on that line. Um, quantum computing to qubits to all kinds of interesting applications out there. Maglev. Maglev, yeah. I've seen like people, um, they've tried, the, tried making the hoverboard from Back to the Future using. Yep. Um, <clears throat> just the principle of superconductivity, just laying down magnets yeah. in this. Not very practical. Yeah, not very practical. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw the video. Was it by Toyota or one of those car companies? Lexus. Lexus, yeah. yeah. Mm. Same one. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, up to you guys to pull it from the future into the present with practical applications. Um, and it's one of those, you know, going back to connecting it to the earlier point, a practical superconducting solution is cannot be done by someone who's an expert in any one of these engineering disciplines. In materials engineering, right? superconductor is a material, you need to make that. Mechanical engineering, you need to cool it down, you need to go down the cryogenic temperatures. The application may be something electric, right? 
and to be able to power it, control it. All those have to come together to make a superconducting system work. So hopefully you can have those convers difficult conversations with teams that <laughs> may or may not agree with the, the vision you have and work together to get those things done. And I think that's, as long as the vision and mission is exciting, I think people can you know, get back in and from any discipline and everything, we'll, we'll come back and make the future actually happen. Because, you know, the future is there. And if you find a flux capacitor to make it easier, let me know. But the future is there. And it's up to us to make it happen through engineering, through science, through math, and through different mediums that are not only math and science and business and startups and who knows so many things. You I'll give you a free uh, underrated, overrated. That <laughs> is totally underrated in engineering, having a clear vision. Mm. Right. So, in, beyond the passion thing we talked about, you know, vision about where you're headed, what's important, what's the problem you're solving, um, and being able to communicate that in a very clear, clear manner. All those skills are underrated in engineering. Is what I would say. And I think. Uh, we're so grateful for your time for, for coming to us. So we want to thank you. And, and especially personally, uh, thank you for your feedback. And <laughs> we, I, I hope to have conversations with you in the future as a way to, to, to make these things actually happen and, and change some of, the, some of the atmosphere that has been you know, here with the, some of the organizations and everything. Just, it, it, like you said, it doesn't have to be that way. And it's just a matter of finding ways and, sure. like you said, make the change that you want to see in the world happen. <laughs> I hope you took uh, my feedback in the right spirit. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it means a lot that you were, you, you were honest and you, and you told me. And, yeah, I, I really thank you for that. Because a, a different person could be like, oh, yeah, this guy doesn't know what he's talking <laughs> about, like, whatever. But you had the energy and effort to say, I don't think you're right on that way. And I, I will tell you why exactly. And I think I actually really appreciate that because... I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I, I just want to know what's actually there and actually, like, what's actually the, the, the truth and the fact in order to actually make things happen and make the future exciting. I've enjoyed this. You guys are going to do great things. Just uh, keep this energy level up. Keep me posted. We will. Right. We will. Thank you. All right. Um, and for the people watching, thank you for, uh, thank you for watching this episode. I'm, I'm sure you gained a lot of out of it. We talked about experiential learning, we, uh, the break, breakthroughs of the future, the future of energy, sustainability, and just, just exciting topics and the upcoming topics that we all as a generation need to start thinking about at this point. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Haran, please put them in the comments and we'll try to get it to him and get them answered for you. Uh, I'm sure you learned a lot and I hope you're looking forward to the next one. Uh, stay curious, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.